I want men to take responsibility for I want every woman in this town to know that. I want women to want to want What do women want? We want to be equal. We want to be listened to. We want to be respected. And we want to be safe. I think the next step in feminism is looking at how we experience being a woman differently. And women of colour in particular have a very different experience. We are people who are competent, we've got agency, we've got skills, we've got so much to contribute. We want to be treated the same as everyone else. I really want to live in a world that really embraces social compassion. 125 years ago, many, many women died in childbirth. That doesn't happen quite so much these days, uh, but health remains a huge focus for women in this country, so I'm delighted to have this panel uh, with me today, one of whom stars in a little film with Mate. So let's watch that first. I want women to feel confident that they can fully engage in every conversation about their, their whānau and their community's health. Health is everything. It is the air that we breathe, the houses that we live in, the food that we eat, the relationships we have, the thoughts that we think and the feelings that we have. It is fundamentally feminine in its whole perspective. Mental health is something that we all have. It's how well our minds are and the change that I want to see and mental health for young women is more conversation. As women, like we need to support each other. I want us to bring a feminine lens to the way we see health and healthcare because it's about time that we actually listened to what women want. Kia ora. Dr. Sash, you started running a Dr. Sash Facebook Live on a Monday night, was it? Yep. Um, a few months ago, a few weeks ago. Yep. Um, what did you find? Well, it's been a really interesting exercise. Uh, if you want to find me, I'm at Dr. Sash um, <laughs> on my relevant social media. Uh, so we, we kind of launched this in relation to, to Well Revolution, which is a company that I founded um, with my business partners, because we wanted to understand. We wanted to understand what people are interested in in terms of their health. It was an experiment. Thought, OK, let's do this thing. Turn it on. Press live. Off we go. And it's been crazy. Like, we have had an overwhelming response to people engaging, asking questions, wanting to understand more. But I think the thing that I've seen uh, through this process is that people are confused. Mm. And a lot of women follow this. So women are really confused about what is health, you know? So that's a massive question, mm -hmm. yeah. what is health? And they're really confused, like, they're, like from their diet to their exercise, you know, do I do keto versus this versus that? There's a lot of questions around, what is health to me? How, do I, how can I actually be healthy? And I think uh, it raises a lot of real fundam fundamental questions because, you know, training in medicine, you know, we learn about sick. We don't learn about health. Yeah. And what people really need is guides to help us become a healthy, healthy people, you know, healthy families and a healthy society. Health literacy or just understanding what is health is a question from if you're living in Rimuera, if you're living on Otara, is that everyone wants to understand, I think, those seeking questions are always there. And what's interesting is to explore what they want to understand and why, and, and how can we help facilitate real discussion around health, because there's heaps of media, there's heaps of products, goji berries, and do you know what I mean? Like, you, you go out there and you don't, you don't know. You think, oh, is this all natural? Is this not all natural? Mm. Should I be lifting weights or should I do cardio? Should I be taking this over that? You don't really know, and I think there's a real um, desire by everyone, no matter where you're from, to try and t to connect to this concept of health. Dame Margaret, no Facebook, back when you were practising medicine. I can say one, though. Can you tell us about some of the changes that you've seen over the years? Yes, in, enormous uh, changes. Some things have moved faster than others, I think. Um, when I think of um, things like sex education, I think we're still grappling with the best way um, to do that. Mm. Um, I think with regards to abortion, uh, there were huge changes when we changed the law in 1977. Prior to that, um, I was involved, well, when I was, when I was young and needed an abortion, uh, there was no possibility. There wasn't even pregnancy tests um, uh, then. And uh, I had a do-it-yourself 
um, abortion, which was a crime in, in those days, and um, one didn't talk about it. And often uh, a killer, too. Mm. And many women were not as fortunate as I was and um, died. And uh, one of the things that I've done in my retirement is to actually seek out some of those stories from, from women who died of um, unsafe uh, abortion. So I've seen a big change there from having to do it yourself to uh, when I was at the student health service at Victoria Universities in the early 70s, having to refer people to Australia, um, which was an ordeal. People had to get a lot of money and um, it was oftentimes the first time they'd ever been out of the country and you felt as much um, a travel agent as a, <laughs> as a, as a doctor uh, trying to, to bridge the, um, that. And so when the law changed in 1977, it really did away with backstreet abortions and really began uh, to do away with the traffic to Australia, although not quite then, uh, because um, that's, a, that's another story, but um, when the uh, Auckland Medical Aid Centre reopened, then, for the first time, I was able to refer people um, to a safe abortion facility in their own country, and that was a huge uh, advance. Are you astonished, as astonished as the rest of us, that it is still in the Crimes Act? Absolutely, mm -hmm. yes. Can you give us a potted history of how that's come about? Well, it really came about because we inherited the English laws and that went back to 1861. And, and then uh, abortion uh, was a crime, but only after quickening. Um, but we inherited those laws and we never changed, so it um, stayed in the Crimes Act uh, as a crime. B because we watched and inherited the English laws, we were quite interested in 1967 because the English law changed then and some of us thought, well, maybe New Zealand will change as well. Mm. But it took us another 10 years and when we did so, uh, we introduced a whole, we certainly got rid of uh, illegal abortionists, but we invented a very complicated system involving two certifying consultants. The grounds for abortion were still, they still stayed in the Crimes Act, um, but there was a new system and we had an abortion supervisory committee, which was brand new, and we had this new system of women, women having to prove uh, to two doctors called certifying consultants um, that they were eligible for an abortion under one of the grounds in the Crimes Act. And the unfortunate thing is that because of the way um, doctors have made the law work, 98% of them are done on the grounds of mental health, which I think is wrong. Mm. And I also think it's wrong that women can't make the decision for themselves, mm. and that it has to be made by um, two strangers sometimes, two certifying consultants who get paid uh, to, to do this. So I'll throw this open to the whole panel because you'll all have different experiences of this, but I have heard um, people, sometimes politicians, mostly men, saying that this system is okay, it works all right, uh, and we should just leave it as it is. And I think, um, although obviously we don't have women travelling to Australia to access abortions, I think that one issue that we're seeing a lot is uh, issues around equity to and access to early medical abortions. Mm. And it's not equal across the country. And we've got women who have to travel outside of their hometown to access these early mm. medical abortions. And I worry, and, and it's starting to come up anecdotally, that actually this is going to see a resurgence in some of the backstreet abortion services because people know, you know, that mm. there's certain things that you can do, certain pills you can take, and, and that's a real concern. And that's what you get out of inequity, I guess, in access that's not for everyone, is, the, is those mm. issues. And I think it's something to keep a watch on and something we need to keep the pressure on. We, we shouldn't have that happening now. We should be able to have access that's fair across the 
country. Yeah. Mm. Julie, this sense that medicine and health is about the body only is a mm. load of bull, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about the yes. work that you're doing with older women in their homes. Yeah, well, I am um, thinking about a lot of different issues that people have raised, and in particular, um, women feeling heard in response mm. to their health needs. Um, what I know from my experience is that health is a really holistic thing for people, is that it's not only focused on emotional well-being or physical health, but we also need to consider the spiritual well-being of people as well as that of their wider whānau. So thinking more about the collective and the wider context and what people and where people live and who they have relationships with and how we can be support them to be good supporters of people to maintain health as well. So a lot of our mahi involves working with people where they feel comfortable in their homes. So I work a lot in South Auckland. We also travel nationally um, and see people in different locations. Um, my and colleague, what, and oh. Working with somebody in their home, what difference does that make rather than sending them off to a clinic? I think for a start, people are genuinely a lot more relaxed and calm. We can do a real um, connection or relationship building exercise. We share a cup of tea, I bring some biscuits. There's a lot of whakawhanaungatanga and relationship building that starts from a really solid foundation. So the focus isn't just on illness, it's looking at well-being in a real general sense, including um, the person's well-being within their home environment mm. and with the other significant mm. people in their home. So quite often when I go and visit somebody, they might have another relative there that they want to incorporate into our session. So I provide a lot of flexibility around that. And I think that's what needs to happen in terms of providing holistic health care for women in Aotearoa. That word holistic keeps coming up, and I know that a lot of you <laughs> feel really strongly about it. Uh, Huhana, um, is Western medicine failing us? <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's easy. Um, what we have failed to do is recognise other medicines. We've got Chinese medicine, thousands of years in development and knowledge. We have Indian medicine, thousands of years. We have Māori medicine, rungwa. Why does every hospital not have a rungwa house centre attached to it so that if I want to go for treatment, and I mean, I'm one of those ones they write off. I have MS, so therefore there's no cure, so they can't do anything. So doctors throw pills at you, but they don't throw anything else. I would love to go and see a tohunga and deal with spiritual stuff and healing stuff. I'd like rungwa medicine, Māori medicine. I'd like meri meri and rome rome. I'd like to know that I could even talk to them about my dietary needs, all of that stuff. It provides for a healthier outcome, plus you bring your whānau in, so you get a more of a, a family-based type of care. It makes sense, but the problem we have in New Zealand is only 1% of all Ministry of Health funding goes to any hauora Māori services. Now, we're 16% of the population, but 33% of Māori have a disability, and 68% of Māori over the age of 40, with 46% under the age of 25. So we are underfunded massively, yet we have some fantastic outputs. And people already know I'm involved in medicinal cannabis, and I'm legally on it. I can't afford it for much longer, so I'd love the government to get their act together, just plugging it, um, but <laughs> you know, just for that moment. But it's very important that we look at that. We need to look at the fact that plant-based medicines can be as effective, if not more effective, for some conditions, uh, rather than pharmaceuticals. So why do we not open our minds, our services, and create a very robust, good primary healthcare system so that we reduce the expense and the cost at tertiary health level? If we were to re-indigenise, if the Waikato um, Hospital um, Health Medical School that they want to create was able to be indigenous focused say postgraduates could go there and learn all about Māori medicine and other indigenous medicines, we could have the best health system in the world because we wouldn't limit ourselves to only Western medicine. That's too limiting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, was just thinking about I want to talk about mental health because we have a crisis in this country yes, and I think we, we all realise that now. Um, Rhonda, you're a police officer, you're a senior police <laughs> prosecutor actually. What is the size of the problem that you see just coming through the parts of the justice system that you interact with? Um, well, obviously the big one that we're concerned about still is meth. Mm. And I don't um, think people actually fully understand, unless they've experienced addiction uh, either directly or indirectly, 
um, just how serious an effect that has, not only on the individual, but on the people around them. Mm -hmm. So people will say, oh, how could she neglect her children like that, not feed her children, spend her money on things? That's, that's the nature of the power <laughs> of an addiction like that. You simply lose all your humanity. Um, interestingly enough, I've just been invited to go to another um, graduation of the Alcohol and Drug Addiction Court. So um, that's one initiative that um, seems to be actually addressing uh, that mm -hmm. problem, but that's dealing with the real hard end of offenders. But throughout my career, uh, I've often found ourselves having to use the justice system to access mental health care. Yeah. When in actual fact, so, those issues of mental health need to be treated to prevent people from, um, from recidivism, right? From, from re-offending. Yeah, it's absolutely a factor. Um, and it's also um, one of the places where we kind of get, we end up being the meat and the sandwich. Um, we um, are not trained psychologists or psychiatric nurses. Our job for the most part is arresting, um, it by force if necessary, um, bad people. Um, and then we get a call to a job where somebody is mentally ill and there is a provision under the Mental Health Act in Section 109 for us to actually take them into custody in order to get them to somebody who can assess them. Um, again, um, by force if necessary um, and that's a very very difficult position for our staff mm. to find themselves in mm. because you're really having to take off one hat which is the enforcer hat and put on the health professional mm. hat and the courts are actually very strict in their mm. scrutiny of the way we apply that so it can be a very tricky situation for young cops especially. It's hard from a doctor perspective too. Yeah. You know, like the whole boundary, we were talking about it before, you know, the boundary between health and and the crime, you know, putting someone in the Mental Health Act is really hard. And it's, yeah. it's you're sort of, you're stuck. You know, you, you're looking at someone you want to help, who needs help, but they're not so unwell that you have to enforce the Mental Health Act. Yeah. But there's this, this big gap that yeah. you're like, you clearly need something, um, but I can't make you do anything. Phyllis, I want to bring you in here because you're GM of Māori Health at um, Lakes District DHB. Um, how difficult has it been to get a DHB, an organisation like that, to acknowledge Tao Māori? I, I, look, I'm really excited about this subject and I think we need a three-day one and I can discuss it. <laughs> okay, but I, I want to say quickly to Rhonda that, that whilst meth, yes, is a problem, alcohol mm. misuse is still yeah. by far Killed the greatest yeah. danger mm. yep. to our communities, particularly yes. our young people. The self-harm rate of, of yeah. Māori, of many people in, in emergency departments is incredible. At any one time in Rotorua Hospital, would see anything up to two to three people a day presenting with self-harm related um, mm. incidents. So for Māori, for example, at the, the current system doesn't work. We know that, we've seen it, we've, uh, Huhan has talked about the issues for Māori in health generally. And I must say, Huhan, I thought, oh my, thank goodness I'm working in the area I do, because we do have access to rongoa for right. our patients and families. We have access to mm. midi in the hospital environment, but that's taken a long time mm. to mm. navigate a health system. And uh, health literacy is hugely important. You yes. have to know what that continuum of care looks like, where you can access different things. For example, any individual who might require some alternate type care at end stage of life can go to the GP and actually say, I know I get $300 for this wrapped in that primary health care package. Yes. I want to go and um, spend it at a Rongo clinic having kawakawa, for example. Yes. If we know what we can access in that health journey, I, I think it's hugely important. Mm. Julie, what would be, this is a really hard one, what would be <laughs> the one thing that you would do to try and bring down our horrendous suicide rate in this country? 
In terms of suicide, I think they definitely, in mental health in general, it needs to be more of an emphasis on prevention and keeping Hilda. people well, on flourishing in life, Hilda. not focusing on the symptomology and what mm. you require to present to mental health services, but focusing on how, how do we build resilience? How do we stay well? How do we flourish in life? I would also suggest that if we're really serious about flipping it over and making it about health, not sickness, mm. then give people the ability to self-direct their funding. Mm. Kilda. Give yep. people the yes. ability to decide. Mm. Give the people the empowerment to make mm. decisions for themselves and their, their families. It's not about me. I'm good at writing scripts and having a bit of a yarn and stuff, but I can't tell you what, how to live your life. Mm. I can't tell you what's health to you. Mm. I can't but we tell do that, you. don't we? we yeah, but totally no, I do do that. <laughs> I'm like, yes, yeah, so I think you really need some non and blah, blah, blah. Here you go. <laughs> It's because it's how I was taught. And I've got to be careful because that's the bureaucracy that I have to reinforce yeah. in the system that I come from. Yeah. But mm. what I really want to say is, hey, man, your back pain, actually, you know what you need to do? You need to do some squats and you actually need to get out there and stretch some of this and do some of that and get out and walk with your dog every day. And actually, I do say that, but I shouldn't. <laughs> I bet you do. I and do. I'm going to take that as your wrap-up comment. I'd like a little kind of... One wish from all of you. Um, can we start with you, Huhana? I want disabled women to have full and free access to all forms of health care. Many disabled women are denied mammograms, are denied cervical cancer um, smear testing, are denied major um, health care prevention access. And so I just want that. When I think back to the sad cases where women, not just women, but people, mm. were just afraid mm. uh, to come uh, to the mm. health service. So, so that's, that's great. From the um, uh, family planning, I think we can still make, make the, uh, that more accessible. And from abortion, we've got a little bit of hope on the horizon uh, because... Um, the Minister of Justice has uh, asked the Law Commission to have a look at some options for making uh, abortion a health issue and not a crime any longer. And we're expecting the report on that um, next month, at the, towards the mm. end of October. I'm hopeful that this may be a change. You and me both. Rona. <laughs> You know, there's a lot of stuff that's going on out there in society where people are dissing other people and mm. putting down other people's uh, options and needs and things like that. And I just think, well, you know, the answer to that really is just don't. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be a dick about it. You know, yeah. actually, it yeah. takes effort to take a view about someone else's life and needs. And I'm speaking here as, as a trans woman. Uh, and I've also been down the suicide path, so I know a bit about that because that comes with that package. But it takes effort to actually insult somebody or mm. stand up against something that's their business and their needs. Mm. All you actually have to do is just don't. Mm, killed her. I like where well, I put that on a t shirt. Mm, just just don't. Isis. Well, I totally agree with the just don't. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'd also like, I guess it's, it's boring, but you know, looking at the social determinants of health mm. and making people's lives easier so that our day to day it's not so stressful mm. that we actually have capacity for people to deal with some of those health issues. And it's like, you know, we say all the time, you know, you're not doing this or you're doing this wrong, you know, um, Māori women aren't um, accessing antenatal care early enough, all of these things. And it's like, what if that's not your priority? What if your baseline is shoes on your feet, like food on the table? You don't have capacity to, mm -hmm. to access more. So I'd like us to, to look at that so that we can say we can build health literacy, we can empower people but I think we have to start there before we can start anywhere in terms of building resilience and mm. um, self care and all of those things we actually just have to start addressing those things that actually are a barrier to, to the really baseline access to health I'm glad you've had a good time. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, I co talk for what everybody has said. I'd like to see a healthcare system that embraces whānau ora, that has a key treatment of aroha and showing compassion and love to each other, 
and yeah, is just inclusive and yeah, accommodates to all diverse communities in Aotearoa. I want it all. <laughs> I think the other thing is for, for those leaders within the health system to be really clear about what the leads, needs of the people are mm. and to listen to the voices of women, yes. particularly Māori mm. women. Yeah. Mm. Kia ora. And that is our show. A huge thank you to all of our expert panellists right throughout today um, for your vision and also your expertise and your hope that you all bring to women right across this wonderful country of ours. Here's to the 125th anniversary of women's suffrage in New Zealand, Aotearoa. Okay, let's party. Hit that music, buddy. you